Welcome back to Bearing Lifers, the podcast that is ready to roll you into the interesting world of bearings. I'm your pilot through the Bearing Airways Ben Walls. Whether you're a seasoned expert or just getting your bearings in the industry, Bearing Lifers guarantees a fantastic conversation. So oil up those bearings because we're about to thrust into our third episode. Today, I'm honored to welcome a distinguished guest who has worn many hats in this dynamic world of bearings. Without further delay, let me introduce our esteemed guest, Scott Ice. Scott, welcome to Bearing Lifers. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem, man. Well, why don't we kick it off with uh, you just kind of going over like how you got into the bearing industry and like what you're currently doing now. Absolutely. So my intro to the industry was not long after college. I graduated with an engineering degree and went to work for a machine tool company in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, one of my aspirations in life post-graduation was not to live in Rockford, Illinois the rest of my <laughs> life. So, okay. so I got a call from a recruiter uh, and they were recruiting for this company named Bauer. And so I have this mental image of Bauer, like Bauer, like the skates, like Bauer, you know, is that, is that who that is? And uh, of course, got to understand through the interview process, this is a bearing company called Bauer. Uh, and at the time, this is right about when NTN had just purchased the Bauer brand from Federal Mogul uh, and uh, decided to take a leap and uh, took a job up in the Detroit area when they still had an office in Bingham Farms, Michigan. So went up there young guy, um, and uh, started a design uh, engineering job working for them. And uh, that was that was foot number one in the door. How long were you with uh, them at the initial? And were you like in just the engineering or was it uh, sales as well? No. So, the, so where that goes from there is uh, did design engineering for a whopping six months there. And if you remember, the aspirations were to leave Rockford and go preferably to somewhere like a bigger city. Detroit was bigger. Chicago was a place I really had in mind to live. Just somewhere that was kind of new, different, bigger city kind of life. And uh, I get news about two months into my design engineering job up there that, um, hey, by the way, just so you know, we're going to close this operation down and we're going to move it to the plant site in Macomb, Illinois. So if you've never been to Macomb, Illinois, where no. one of the Bauer plants is located, uh, it is about 25,000 people. So we're going the complete other direction now in terms of population and things to do. Uh, it's the home of the Western Illinois Flying Leathernecks, I'll have you know, hey. and, and, the, and the Bauer Macomb plant. So uh, made a move down there and uh, continue to work for that group for about eight months. Uh, and then all of a sudden this guy named Pete Ike comes in and uh, has a meeting and Pete runs the application engineering group up in Mount Prospect for the NTN side. You know, again, I'm on the Bauer side of the business designing tapered and cylindrical roller bearings and Pete's working for the application engineering group. He was actually the, the manager of the group at the time. And uh, he came down and we were working on a project to design a brand new product line. So we we're working on kind of an enhanced uh, bearing line and Got to know Pete through those meetings and uh, gradually through the course of conversations, it was uh, so. Uh, didn't you say something about you got a girlfriend that lives in Chicago? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do, actually. Uh, yeah, my my very serious girlfriend. He goes, so would you ever be interested in moving to Chicago? I'm like, when? So that was the beginning of uh, my transferring over to the application engineering department for NTN. So I worked there. I uh, went to work for Pete in uh, 1993, I think it was, and spent about two years in that group. Uh, loved what I did. Great way to get a balance of the technical side. You know, I'd studied technical things, uh, enjoyed the engineering side, but really I didn't see that being where I wanted to be long term. I didn't want to necessarily be just in the engineering side of the business. Wanted to kind of get maybe more on the sales and commercial side. So, um, the application engineers would go out in the field and support the various salespeople. So I had almost all the Western region salespeople. So I was traveling out to Denver. I was going out to California. Uh, Texas was where the office was actually based on in the Dallas area. So that throughout conversations with the regional manager, he finds out that I kind of have that aspiration. And uh, so he quickly says, what do you think about going into a sales position? And the original inquiry was about a position that was open in San Francisco. So for Midwesterners okay. like myself and in and and in this whole time process, by the way, I've gotten married. So now yep. I'm married. My girlfriend becomes my wife. 
Um, we're married and uh, we're making this decision about are we going to go out west, live in San Francisco, um, and it took a while to make the decision. It was a big change, you know, huge, expensive huge life place decision. to live. Yeah. Absolutely, a big life decision. You know, cool though. Like we're thinking, Bay Area is awesome. Be kind of an interesting place to check out. Um, definitely interested, but that cost of living thing. So finally make the decision, call the regional manager back. And, um, I, I kid you not the way this conversation goes. I said, I've thought about it, Wayne, I'm, I'm ready to go. going to make the decision. We're going to make the move. And he goes, you know what? Forget about San Francisco. What do you think about Denver? And I'm like, I just spent two months thinking about this. Like, <laughs> it's a big decision. So long story short the decision on denver was about 10 minutes you know because <laughs> we're thinking true. all right that's a lot closer to home plus it's the mountains we're both uh, skiers like yeah. i have an outdoors um you know downhill skier i love outdoors you know winter summer anything and so that decision was a lot easier and uh so took that job in sales and uh did that for a little while and then from there i uh switched companies yeah. and uh went from ntn to work for nsk for a while took a sales job with them and then uh Continued to progress through other positions, uh, moved into a corporate job uh, in Michigan about five years later and uh, was there for about four years uh, and then uh, came to Chicago where we are right now uh, in 2005 and uh, following a few other changes in my career, I'm uh, now responsible as the vice president of sales for the industrial aftermarket group. So I lead the sales team that does selling of MRO um, and a little bit of OEM business that all goes through distribution. So our distributor channel partners. So that's wow. my, my role now. And my, I guess my, uh, short story on the journey there. So on your journey through the, the bearing industry, as it's been so far, was there a time that you realized you were so valuable to the bearing industry that you were probably in it for life? I haven't really asked this question to people yet, but was it, was it a time period? Was it an experience level or was it just the passion that you built up for it? You were like, I'm too valuable to like remove myself from this industry. Like I'm having too much fun. Yeah. Was, was it a time period and a, a passion? Was it an experience? What, sure. what, what, what clipped that little notch in your belt that uh, kept you in it for 30 years? Yeah. Great question. And, uh, and I have a very compelling answer to it because I left the industry for a while and came back. Okay. And, and a huge part of that was, uh, I love how you said it because like uh, my, my, my value to the industry, which thank you for saying that um, it was more so the view of the industry that I know and therefore where I had the relationships and I could be effective and get things done. Yeah. So value to the industry, but also knowledge in the industry. That was really a big part of it was, you know, I went out into fluid power for a little while and I was working for a mechanical seal company for a little while. And both of them were good. They were good experiences. The companies were good. Um, it's not that hard to learn another industrial product. Um, there's a lot of similarity in the types of customers you're going into, um, the types of selling experiences you have. But absolutely, there was a pull and an appeal to get back to the bearing side because yeah. it truly was what I knew. Uh, it was the passion that I had. And I really felt like it was where I was the most effective because of, again, those relationships and that knowledge base. Yeah, excellent. Great answer. So over your career, what are the current challenges you see in the industry today versus how the industry has been when you started? Like it, it's it's undergone a handful of things. I mean, we you look at the most recent things with COVID or, you know, it, toward the end of the 90s there, we had the Internet. So like we've had a ton of technological changes throughout society, let alone the berry industry. What challenges do you see today that you didn't have back then and and where do you think it's going to head in the future? Yeah, I think the biggest thing isn't as much about technology in and of itself, because, you know, our world on the manufacturing side, things have to get produced. Yep. You still have to make all the things that we consume and use every day. So I think there's a fair amount of stability for us in our industry. So the thing I would point to more so, which we've all talked about significantly in our industry, is really kind of losing some of the brain power and the experience. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, here we are, the bearing lifers. This is literally what we're talking about. Uh, and the challenge is to find the people that replace, you know, whether it's me or others that you've interviewed for, for the bearing lifer that have been 30 plus years and someday won't be in the industry anymore. So I think a huge challenge for us as an industry is getting young talent. Uh, you know, and we talk about this in our industry associations quite a bit. 
that that's a big area for us to focus on. Technology, I think, is something that we just have to figure out. How do we plug it in um, to make our organizations, our industry better? Yeah. You know, I sit on a task force at uh, BSA, the PIE task force that's looking at how do we share rich content data across companies? Um, you know, that's one way that we're trying to use uh, technology. Certainly all of us are trying to pursue things in robotics um, and automation in our warehousing and our logistics. Um, we're all trying to figure out how to use AI, uh, whether it's on our CRMs and our ERPs or whatever it is. And those are all things that I think are extremely relevant, but I don't look at them necessarily as challenges um, that that hurt our industry. They're just things for us to figure out how to make it better. How and new, to new tools. Yeah. That's right. New tools yeah. become more efficient because again, you know, is, is bearings and power transmission going to go away? Absolutely not. Because again, we have to make food, we have to make steel, we have to make paper, we have to make chips you know, and electric vehicles and all the things that are the growing industries of today, they all have to get produced. And bearings and PT and the distributors that support all of us manufacturers are still going to be very relevant in that world. But again, how do we get the people yeah. uh, that, to come into the industry to fill the jobs that are going to be opening more and more all the time? So I think that that still remains really one of our biggest challenges. And I think the other thing that I wouldn't call it as a challenge as much as it is just something that we're going to continue to have to navigate yep. is consolidation. That's not done. You know, companies buying companies, whether they're looking to get into additional verticals, expand into different product lines, um, look for just enhanced value uh, on, the, on both the distribution and the manufacturing side for both. Yeah, you brought up uh, that tribal knowledge that uh, is starting to cycle out. And, you know, th through talking with a handful of guys on this podcast or at the association things, that's that's been a trend either in this industry or just in general here in the U.S. with the manufacturing and a lot of the blue collar jobs not looking as appealing to kids. And we've been telling kids for so long, you have to go yeah. to college. There's no other way to be successful. Um, do you have any ideas or um maybe a way to look at the bearing industry as, as an exciting industry for that next generation. I mean, I always look at it like bearings transfer power, any industry that's yeah. got a rotational part, or you're trying to transfer power bearings are used. So if you're passionate yeah. about something, I can, I can tie in, you know, if you're excited about space travel, or if you're excited about NASCAR or, or wind energy, if somebody's excited about climate change, I can reel them into the bearing industry pretty easy. Is there, is there something that you look at when you're trying to figure out how to acquire that new talent other than, you know, what the industry is doing now with possible just job fairs and maybe attacking some of the colleges? I mean, what, yeah, what I think what's a good strategy? Yeah, strategy wise is a good question. And um, I think you mentioned a couple of them. I think it is trying to recruit at um, you know various colleges, um, try to promote the industry in different ways. Um, I think what we're looking for, to your point, in terms of the personnel, and maybe this is part of what we've got to find a way to show is what the variety of what we do looks like. Yeah. And anybody that's got that curiosity factor of how things are made. Um, you know, they love to watch Mythbusters or National Geographic Explorer like I did in younger years. And they're just curious about things, curious about how things are made, what different industries look like. Um, if we can find a way to get people to see that and recognize it, I think yeah. that's huge for us because that is just a major part of our world. You know, bearings. And again, I, I, I talk about PT right with it, right, because they're both hand yeah. in hand. You know, we're all kind of together in the same thing, whether it's gears, bearings, motors, you know, shivs, sprockets, chains. I mean, all of it is going into stuff that's uh, in every kind of uh, industry that has rotating equipment. And rotating equipment is everywhere. Yeah. And so I think that's the thing that we've got to really figure out. How do we how do we get that message across? How do we get uh, people to understand that it's cool? You get to see a bunch of different things because when you get there, it's a little bit like an accountant. An accountant can work for a consulting company like a KPMG and you know, they're working on an audit or a project for some some type of uh, company like uh, Nike or somebody. And, you know, they can end up taking a job with them. Well, same thing in our world, you know, not trying to say we'll bring people in and we want to chase them off and hope they go to work for a customer. But <laughs> the reality is they could. Yeah. There's a lot of different industries that they would get exposed to and a lot of different aspects of those industries. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, 
30 some years into the bearings at least right i mean what do you have you told it up told it up are you pushing the 40 uh, year let's see. In the so bearing 90, industry? yeah right exactly at it so 93 so 31 technically just, oh perfect okay so within those three decades what is your most memorable bearing story and i ask this question because i've i've been doing it 20 years but Looking at my every six month thing, I try to keep a little journal where I write down just crazy things. Either customers have asked me to do applications or just a wild story that I've heard um, with some of the product that we work on. And it's every six yeah. months. Somebody that's had an entire more decade and somebody who's probably done some of the really interesting things out on the application side. What, what's a cool bearing story that uh, you can share with us? Yeah, I got one that's, um, it's, it, let's just say this, that it's going to be a little self-deprecating in, in addition to the fact that it's, a, I guess, an interesting story on top yeah. of it. So uh, many years ago, I was at the uh, Nucor Hertford Steel Mill and uh, working on a project in which we were going to replace a slewing ring bearing. So part of the job was to get in and uh, cut out some old bolts uh, and get ready to take the old bearing out to bring the new one in. and. Um, I, you know, working with a team of about four of us kind of in and out taking turns. I mean, we're literally in, uh, you know, one of the guys from the mills literally having to basically cut, uh, weld cut some of these bolts off and doing other things to clean up inside the uh, arc furnace again to get ready for the uh, the new bearing. And uh, long job, long day, right? Uh, get to probably about 10 or 11 o'clock at night and we're finally done with what it is that we've got to do. And I got to get going. So the rest of the crew um, from our company was staying there. I was working for NSK at the time. And the rest of the crew was staying there in town and they were going to come back and do some other things. But I had to get going. I had to, something I had to get back to the, the next day. So jump in the car, start to drive. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to the Hertford Mill, but like a number of new core mills, it's, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. It's a pretty good drive to get to the airport. So a few hours drive to get up into Virginia to get to the airport. Uh, and, you know, there's no cell service. So you're just quietly driving three hours, you know, midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, finally get to the hotel, dead tired, ready to get just maybe three hours of sleep before yeah. I got to get up and get on an airplane to go back home. And as I'm rolling into town, cell service comes back in and my phone, my phone just blows up. Bing, 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 bing. Text message, voicemail, text me like, whoa, wait, whoa, what? So finally, I I, I look at what's being said, and I, and I couldn't quite get all the text messages in yet, but I see I got a, one of the voicemails. I, I grab it and listen to it, and it's our field service manager, and he's like, get your ass back down here. Your lockout tag out tag is still on the piece of equipment. Oh, and no. <laughs> so I was that guy. The one that in the safety presentation before we went and did our job, they give you the whole don't ever, ever yeah. leave your yeah. tag on because we will never allow you back on this site again. So thank goodness they all covered for me. I got to turn right around and head all the way back. I mean, there's no question. It's not like, do you have to do this? Yeah, you got yeah. to go back. So I drive all the way back, take my tag off. They hung around and acted like the job was still going. Oh, so the wow. Guys from the mill are coming around trying hey, to find out. Are you guys that's... done? Are you done? I mean, hey, what are you doing right now? It doesn't look like you're doing much. So they hung out and covered my ass. So I was not uh, asked to uh, unceremoniously never make it back to that mill. But uh, hey, that it, you got to get the job done somehow. And uh, you got to protect the, the crew getting done. it done. You got to. That's go. right. It wasn't, wasn't one of those get the job done. This was this was this was me. Uh, with one of those brain fart moments that, uh, ah. you know, I, I caught a lot of grief for from the crew. And uh, to this day, they will never let me forget that. One. Hey, that's the best part about people uh, having mistakes like that. You can hold it over them for really ever. You yeah. can keep jabbing them with it. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and now uh, all of our illustrious viewers can poke at you as well. That's right. There you go. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said the mill name. I'm like, what was this guy's name again? Let me make sure he doesn't show up here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, like you being a bearing lifer, are there any other bearing lifers in the industry throughout your journey that uh, you would like to kind of name drop and kind of highlight the fact that there are other people in this industry that have built 
people up in this industry. You were definitely one of the uh, top guys. You were one of the first people I reached out to to actually do this podcast. And my list since going to these associations and finding people to connect with that that want to just help and make the industry better and and bring up the new generation like myself and, and a lot of the other younger guys at these shows. Was there anybody like that in your career that really put, put his arm under your uh, and just kind of brought you into this crazy industry and kind of gave you the tools to succeed in it? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll talk about a few different people. Um, one of the ones that I'll mention was in my first sales job. So when I made that move out to Denver and had my first sales position, you know, it took a little while to kind of get the the sea legs, if you will, and really kind of get my my, my feet underneath me in terms of being a sales rep. And, and the funny thing is, I thought that, you know, hey, I've got this technical background, understand the product really well, um, you know, and I feel like I've got a decent kind of personality to be able to relate to people. And so, you know, I think I'll do well in sales and found out that, yeah, it takes a little longer than that. You know, you've got to establish relationships, who you are, earn the trust. Um, get people to have confidence that, yeah, you do actually know what you're talking about, yeah. but show up enough times, you know, that old six thing, six calls or whatever to make that first sale. I mean, there's different numbers that people will throw out, but um, it took me a while. And so one of the people that I met is I'm kind of on that part of the journey was a gentleman named Rudy Hessling. And Rudy was uh, for a big chunk of his career, the, the literally bearing specialist for Kodak company. Oh, so, wow. Which became Eastman Kodak, which I think is called something else now, because um, I think Eastman Chemical and the Kodak group are split. And I don't, I don't remember what it's under anymore, but um, he started out in Rochester, New York, and then he moved to Colorado where they had the plant in Windsor. Um, and then he and I crossed paths when he was he got hired by what was more bearing at the time, which is now applied yep. um, as their bearing specialist. And so we started to cross paths with each other and really clicked right away, you know, just kind of background, interest, passion, et cetera. Uh, and then if, fast forward about six months, we both end up going to work for NSK about the same time. Um, me, myself as a sales rep, and he came in as a field service engineer. And okay. what Rudy was great about and what, what the value that I got out of him was it was a partnership. You know, yeah. my role was the sales and commercial side. And, you know, I understood that aspect of it well. And even though I had a technical background, his was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and it was so much deeper because he had so much more real world experience. And, and what I mean by that is he had been in and out of every application you can possibly imagine. You know, whether it was the drag line at, the, at one of the coal mines up in Gillette or it was Rocky Mountain Steel um, you know, all the different um, heavy industry, light industry, food and beverage plants, you name it. It was just a walking encyclopedia of the equipment, the bearings that go in and et cetera. And so um, he had relationships all over the place, too, with all the maintenance people, et cetera. We just partnered up really well yeah. and had a lot of success together. And the, it was almost a little bit of a father son relationship, too. I mean, his age relative to me, I was a late 20s guy at the time. And he was well into his 50s and his kids were the same age as me. And uh, so it was a bit like a father son thing, in addition to the fact it was just a really good partnership. Uh, and again, we did did a lot of good things together and uh, had a really good run. And um, yeah, still somebody I stay in touch with to this day. So yeah, yeah, he's I'm one of them. And uh, I'll throw a couple other people out that have been influential in my career. I mentioned one of them earlier, which is Pete, my boss. Um, you know, he brought me into the engineering department in uh, Mount Prospect many years ago, uh, gave me an opportunity that really kind of, in a sense, opened a lot of doors subsequently for me kind of moving on in my career. And uh, he's a very, very smart person, extremely knowledgeable, one of the strongest technical people I've ever known. Um, and he's been a, a good uh, business boss and mentor as well, you know, understands the commercial side of the, of the business as well. And so he's He's also done a lot for myself and others inside our company and inside the industry and has given a lot. You know, he's been the president at ABMA. He's been very involved in BSA, other organizations. Uh, and then another gentleman who unfortunately uh, passed away last fall that was another very, very good mentor and a name that a lot of people know in the industry was Ali Martins. Yeah. Uh, Ali was with um, SKF for quite a few years. He was at Applied Industrial for quite some time. And then uh, we crossed paths at NSK. 
So he had taken over in uh, a job that was similar to what I do today now um, at NSK at the time. And he was looking to expand the aftermarket team. And I was one of those new hires that came in during that process. And uh, he was always a very good mentor. Um, he was very passionate about organizational structure, behavior, um, what I would call emotional IQ. Um, you know, people relating to people. He was, you know, towards the end of his career, after he retired, he got into um, still continuing to work, but now on a, on a uh, consultant basis right. for a company that did a lot of like the disc profiling, where you kind of look at the different personality types and how do you relate um, across to each other. And yeah. uh, he was very passionate about that. So he's very passionate about developing people, mentoring them. Um, trying to make sure that they understood how best to communicate with each other, et cetera. So, so another, another gentleman that was uh, significant and influential in my career. Yeah, that's, it's a heck of a list. Absolutely. I mean, I've haven't met all of these guys, but I've heard so many people tell stories of some of these guys. And I mean, I know yeah. Pete pretty good, but uh, yeah, I've heard Ali Martin's name and I think I have met him, but it was a long time ago when he did a, a shop visit over here with uh, Steve, oh, sure. our owner who passed. But uh, yeah, this, this list is a, it's a pretty impressive list. The more uh, names I get on it from people being on the show or just talking to people at the associations, there are so many people that I felt that this industry has that, that we've all rallied behind, but it's not even a rally. It's more just because they're so willing and so open with their knowledge and experience and their passion about the industry. It just breeds that passion outward. You know, they, you know, people gravitate toward that. So it's, it's pretty exciting. I like it. I'm passionate about it. If I'm, I know you're passionate about it. So it's, Absolutely. it's good to see how the industry is uh, at this point right now and, and just trying to get to that next generation of guys in it i'm i'm really excited to see that passion go one step further well i can tell you that you know from where i sit that's likewise you know ben i love that you're doing this um because it shows the passion that you have that you want to kind of get this story on you know let's yeah. let's tell this story let's let people that have done this for a long time um say what it is that that brought them into the industry that made them love it stay in it you know and and what it is about it that uh they want to tell other people so uh, it's cool. Glad it you're is. doing this. So appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Last question to wrap it up. Um, do you see anything new in the industry coming? I mean, bearings, I don't think we're going to see a, a huge overhaul of what a bearing product is, but coatings, materials, technologies, automation, monitoring systems, like what's new in the industry that we should kind of keep our eye on or where, where's the industry kind of heading with uh, like new technologies and stuff? Yeah, I think the biggest one for new technologies, you're right, it's a mature product. And in a lot of ways, it still has to do a lot of the same things it's done forever uh, in form, fit and function. And yeah. I don't think you're going to see this crazy new design all of a sudden happen. Uh, it's not impossible. You know, there there didn't sure. used to be the spherical roller bearing and then it got designed. So there's certainly been new designs, but it's been decades since you've had a, just a completely new design. So I think it is going to be a lot more about coatings, about uh, materials and heat treatments. Yeah. You know, those are the things that you can really do something with that don't change the boundary dimensions or the form, fit, and function, but can really extend life. And I think the other, you mentioned condition monitoring and, and not just as a standalone thing, uh, but I think another thing that'll be really a, a bit of a uh, race and focus for the companies is to how can you integrate a sensor in the actual hard product itself? Can oh, interesting. Yeah. As, can you embed a sensor into a bearing, for example, and, and uh, be able to get readings and monitor that way? Um, so I think that's the type of thing that's that's likely to get explored is the kind of the what's next, you know, at least in terms of true product. You know, those because, again, those are the areas we can influence. Certainly lubrication, um, you know, is another one that's a, a huge influence on what bearing life looks like and continuing to get better lubrications. Uh, lubricant, excuse me, and lubrication delivery methods. Yeah. Um, so I think it's more of those kinds of things than it is like is revolutionary new design or brand new product right. category. It's going to be, you know, continued iteration on on some of those areas that you can actually impact. Well said. Scott, thank you so much for uh, coming on and giving me 15, 20 minutes of your time and just kind of talking through your journey in the bearing industry. I really appreciate it. Thank you. 
Absolutely, Ben. Hey, enjoyed it. Thank you and uh, appreciate it. As we wrap up this episode of Bearing Lifers, keep an eye out for our next installment. We'll keep spinning tales that keep this industry fascinating. And if you or someone you know is a Bearing Lifer and want to share their story, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Until next time, keep those bearings turning. <laughs>